Hello, and welcome back to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. And yes, I do have a slightly larger dog on my lap today, and I'll tell you why. It's stress relief. Because I spent today, you know, getting my stuff together to make sure that my research was on fleek, having spent a long time researching this case. And then I sat down for the few hours that it takes me to obviously record it. And then when I removed the disc, it corrupted, which meant that literally I had nothing, nothing. So dogs reduce stress. So I'm gonna record this again, and hopefully even better than the last one. Although if it doesn't go as well, I can pretend that the last one was so amazing that it's a shame that no one will ever get to see it. Anyway, this is Molly. She's going to keep me company for a short while, just whilst I realign my mindset and balance myself into a position where I lose the hostility and bitterness I feel for my equipment. If you're new to this channel and you're thinking, why is this woman rambling on about something that I don't care about? Just get to the content. I release crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday religiously. Crime and consistency is my catchphrase. And if you like deep dive crime cases that are diligently researched and fact checked, then I am the channel for you. Today's case is one that I didn't know a lot about. And I'm kind of glad I didn't because it's been rather traumatizing learning about it. But also, it's one of those cases that you may have found went under the radar as far as your true crime knowledge is concerned. So it is really intriguing. And again, you know what I'm like about systemic failures. I like being able to acknowledge them and look at whether things have changed. And this case certainly highlights the issues that some systemic failures can present. Also, before I start, big thanks to all of you who give me a like. If you subscribe, thank you. If you don't, why are you watching this without subscribing? Get there now. And for all of your comments and support and your help on Patreon, where I do my podcasts, and of course, on my YouTube membership, you're flipping legends. So let's crack on with that said and me just getting more zen as I stroke my dog. That's not a euphemism. Literally is a dog. Today I'm going to talk about Peter Bryan. So Peter Bryan was born in London on the 4th of October 1969 and he came from a family of seven children. He was the youngest of seven children and I think we can all agree that when parents have got lots of children it can be absolutely wonderful. It can be an environment where you always have a friend and you feel massively connected and it has so many positives aligned with it. But it also means that your parents are not going to be as involved with you as they may be if you had maybe only one sibling or an only child. Just entering that in because of an attentional issue that can sometimes befall children from large families. Equally, as I said, lots of blessings where large families are concerned as well. He had four brothers, so quite a male dominated environment, and he had two sisters. Worth noting at this point that two of his older brothers suffered from mental illness, and Brian would do too. Whilst not all mental illness can be tracked genetically, certainly there is some evidence that certain conditions may have some kind of genetic predisposition. His parents were born in Barbados, and like a lot of people, they came to England in the 1950s for maybe a different life. Who knows, they may have thought it a better life. All I can think is Barbados, UK. I know where I'd be. It'd be Barbados. But I appreciate people come for a whole heap of reasons and the UK has got lots of blessings. It's just whenever I think of Barbados, well, I kind of think about really expensive but beautiful holidays that I can't afford, white stretches of beach, blue skies, and just a chill life. I'm sure it isn't like that if you're born there and have to work really hard though. It's just in my mind. Anyway, they come over to England in the 1950s and what I'd say about Brian's childhood when I explored it is that there is disruption. So when he was four or five, there's a family move and they moved to Newham in Greater London. And he had hardworking parents without a doubt. So both his parents worked 
And that meant that Brian and his two youngest siblings were left with childminders. So obviously they were looked after, but there wasn't necessarily a parental interaction that may have benefited him when he was very young. Also, attentionally, there are some issues regarding his mother purely because she was away for long periods of time visiting her eldest children abroad who had remained in Barbados. And I think for any child, you don't understand the complexities of being a parent. All you know is that they're your foundation of support, they're your security, they're the individual that hopefully you run to when you're struggling and you want them to be present. And at times that's not possible. Think about parents who are in the army. It does not deny for a second that they adore their children and would do anything for them. But it just means that for the child, there can be some questions about why that parent is absent and sometimes feel that the parent is choosing the career or in this case, visiting other siblings over being with them. And whenever there's an attachment issue, we can see some quite serious psychological distress. So it's worth bringing it in that the fact that mum was not always present in his life, albeit for a perfectly reasonable excuse, which is that she was visiting other children of hers. Another thing that certainly was not positive for Brian was school, it really wasn't. First of all, he was one of those kids that struggled to create peer alliances. He had very few friends. It's reported anecdotally that people were not so sure of him at school. And certainly in his early years, we start to see problems educationally. So he struggles with reading and he struggles to a point where he requires extra tuition. A lot of people who are around the 70s and 80s and 90s in education will have been in a scenario where kids were taken out of class and given extra help. There was a lot more funding in the UK for those kind of things once upon a time. I mean, who knew with the amount of money that the government can just bail out multi-billion pound businesses, but somehow when it comes down to support in school for children that actually need it, that seems to have just dried up completely but who am I to judge? Anyway, at that point in time, they were still giving kids extra tuition in school. And while some children would feel that that was a big benefit, Brian didn't. He was really ashamed. He felt really embarrassed by this. He was quite a tough boy. So arguably it may be that he felt reputationally, it was damaging to him. And as he gets older into adulthood, he's actually diagnosed with dyslexia. I'm diagnosed with dyslexia. I'm sure a lot of people watching this now have been diagnosed. When I have my educational statement made, you know I'm not just dyslexic, I'm dyscalculic, dyspraxic. The point is that it meant that teachers often in high school thought I was just really lazy. I was excellent at expressing myself, but just couldn't be bothered writing it down. Turns out that's just a big feature of being dyslexic, but for him, it identifies again some more struggles that he would have had in his education. And what we see with children who struggle in that way and feel that education is difficult for them, unless you have real support around you, it can often lead to a level of dysfunction. And of course, it can mean that children elect to do things like not attend school because they're struggling to keep up. And he did struggle to keep up academically with his peers. During his school years, both primary and secondary, Brian was also known as a bully. And he wasn't your, don't get me wrong, nobody should be a stereotypical bully. We shouldn't be like, well, that's an acceptable bully. Like no bullying is acceptable, you'll know that. But what we expect to see is more low level bullying in school. So I'm talking about the snipes and the gripes, the bitchiness, the dirty looks. I'm talking about the rumors spread. You know, I'm talking about that level. It's really painful, it's really upsetting, but for example, you may never encounter physical attacks. Well, that's not how Brian operates. Brian was a real physical bully. He went out of his way to pick on kids that were physically weaker than him. As soon as he saw a vulnerability in those individuals, he went straight there and exploited them. And the reason I say this kind of bullying is unusual is that he would make them give him sweets. He would make them give him money, but he'd also really demean and humiliate them. 
So he'd make them get down on their knees and tie his shoelaces. And that is ultimate power. And like I said, when you hear about bullying, and I've worked for years with very dysfunctional groups of individuals, I've run pupil referral units for young people who aren't in the system normal education wise. So I have seen children with challenges, not ever in that time have I witnessed an individual do things in such a manipulative way that you're actually making them tie your shoelaces. Like I said, I've seen physical altercations, I've seen verbal interactions of cruelty, all of those things. But this is a power play that's very unusual in this age frame. It's about controlling and humiliating in the same moment. That clear enjoyment of power that Brian experiences, that sets the tone and the scene for what we're gonna talk about today. And it doesn't ease as he gets older. So when he gets into secondary school, the bullying just intensifies more. He starts to become very physically aggressive with other boys, and then it extends to females, but it extends in a different way. So he harasses female pupils, and as Brian himself would reflect, the main aim of harassing those girls was to try to get sex from them. And we're not talking about Shall we go to the cinema on Saturday night? I'll take you to Wimpy or McDonald's and maybe we can have a fumble behind Argos. I'm not talking about that kind of trying to get sex from them. That's pretty normal for adolescents. I'm talking about literally trying to get sex from them without any consent. He would constantly get into trouble for, quote, feeling up girls at lunch. For those of you who are sat there thinking, what's she on about feeling up? It's a term that we would relegate, basically, to the 80s and 90s, probably the 70s as well. It was a term that was used when a man would, or a boy, would grab a girl inappropriately in a sexual way, you know, just for hijinks. Now, massively illegal, as it should be, then, ha, just accept it. It's part of being female. And basically, those things didn't even lead to him getting suspended. Yeah, forget excluded permanently. This guy was able to go around sexually harassing and molesting women and young girls pretty much in his entire life without really any kind of recourse. So he does get suspended from school, but not for that. Yeah, he gets suspended from school for slapping a female teacher. So, I mean, again, what does that tell you? If he isn't excluded permanently for violence towards a female teacher, it very much demonstrates what sign of the times was. Because at the end of the day, these days, you would have the police at school, the student would certainly be charged or at least given a caution. And without a doubt, their time in the educational establishment that they were attending would no longer be available to them because we understand that it's just not an acceptable thing these days for any kind of violence like that to ensue in these kind of places. But he just gets a suspension. And the problem with that as well is what we're looking for when we're talking about the formation of personalities and behaviours like Brian is exhibiting is consequential action. Because if there isn't really severe consequences, then it doesn't reaffirm that that behavior needs to change and shift. Often, it can actually mean that it reinforces that the behavior isn't really that bad. Even though he's allowed back into school after assaulting a female teacher, and bear in mind, a lot of the assaults that are highly inappropriate are towards women, so Brian has a penchant for that particular behavior, he also starts to truant, and that gets worse and worse and worse, which, if you already think that he has got these issues with his education, he doesn't know he's dyslexic, but it's certainly impacting on his academic levels and opportunities. The more time he's out of high school, the more problematic it's going to be for him in the long term. He's going to lose more and more of that foundational learning. It's going to exacerbate the problems that he has. It's going to increase the negative behavior because he's going to be wanting to try to get out of lessons so that he doesn't feel embarrassed. And it adds that constant additional layer to problems that he's facing. And it's not just in school that we're seeing this behavioral issue. 
he's getting himself into so much trouble outside of school. And from the age of 12, he starts smoking cannabis. And this is something that's gonna blight his life to some degree, his relationship with cannabis, because he's a very heavy smoker for a very long time. He also becomes part of a gang, and that gang is involved in street robbers. So he would go up to people in the street and take items of money or things that he wants, like watches. But basically it's a high level violent crime that in the UK you get a custodial sentence these days for street robbery. He was known to steal from shops. He was often somebody who carry weapons, contextual, I guess, when you think about gang relationships, but certainly showing early signs of high level dysfunction and dangerous behavior. And people who knew him said that he did that because he really enjoyed the sense of power and excitement it gave him. And all the way through today's case, I think concentrate on the fact that what we're looking at really is power domination dynamics, in my opinion, at least. Now he leaves school early and you won't be surprised. I've explained the issues that he was facing there, but he does manage to get a part-time job. He ends up working at a clothes stall in Petticoat Lane Market, London, which is an amazing market in London at the time. And then he actually goes on to have a job teaching cooking at his local soup kitchen. So we can see that certain pro-social behaviours are there. We can also note that he obviously feels that it's important to work. And he did have good role models in his parents, who were both workers. But... It's not really enough for him. So even though he's working, he's always engaged in criminal behavior. Shall we say he is supplementing his income by stealing and doing things that are a little bit questionable in our society. Then Brian moves from working in the soup kitchen and he starts working for an Indian family. They're called the chefs and they've done really well for themselves. They own a chain of clothes stores and he gets a job there as a shop assistant. Now, to be a shop assistant, you have to be willing to deal with quite a lot, don't you? It's not an easy job. One, you're on your feet all day. Secondly, you're dealing with customers and we all know and we've all seen how certain customers can be. You have to be able to manage conflict and you certainly have to be very amenable to people's needs and requests. So he's obviously able to manufacture that in spite of some of the more problematic aspects of his personality. Bear in mind, we can all agree that equally, a serial killer can be nice 95% of the time. It's just 5% of the time they go and needlessly and brutally murder people. So we all have shades of our personality. Now in that shop, where he's working as a shop assistant, the shop owners have a daughter and she's called Nisha. So she works alongside him in the shop. She's about four years younger than Brian. So she's a really young woman. Now think about Brian's historic conduct that we've talked about towards females. I just want you to think about whether Nisha would have been dealing with a man who was respectful, who entertained professional boundaries, or how he might have acted in a way similar to how he used to when he was at school. Because whilst we can say on occasion lepers change their spots, often they just lessen them a little bit and maybe die a few off, but they're always there. I know some people just amount to amazing things after being personality types that we look at and question, but for the most part, the kind of behavior that I'm talking about right now so far, it's not boding well for Brian and his impact on the world around him. Now, being employed, as I said, did not dampen down Brian's aggressive behavior at all. And when we look at in 1987, when he's 18, one of the things that Peter Brian had done was that he tried to throw a man out of his window on the sixth floor. Yeah, the man was another resident in the block of flats and the victim basically contacted the police and said, this guy has just tried to throw me out of my window. It was completely unprovoked and I don't know where it came from. That's literally what happened. And if I'm honest, 
that kind of action where Brian just in a completely unprovoked way is very violent is going to be a feature of his future violent behavior. Now, ultimately, the police took no action. Hello, emergency services. What service do you need? I need the police, please. Hello, the police. Hi, this guy has just like literally tried to throw me from my sixth floor flat. Are you okay? Well, yeah, I managed to struggle and avoid him actually throwing me out and I would have gone to my certain death. Okay, well, if you're okay and you aren't injured and I can't be bothered to take this seriously, let's just call it a day. They've hung up. I imagine it went something like that. I've said this before, I'll say it again. I'm not sure what a lot of police were doing in the 70s and 80s. Anyway, massive red flag missed. It's not normal. It's not acceptable and it's certainly not legal to nearly throw somebody from a sixth floor flat to certain death. So at this point, we now a few years on have Brian earning money, having a job, working with Nisha in the shop, but he's constantly involved in criminal activity. He wants to supplement his income that way. There were a few things that majorly he did to accommodate that need. So basically he sold drugs. And the other thing is he mugged people. And the reason I'm using the term mugged people, as opposed to what I referred to a minute ago, which was robbery, is because again, back in the day, particularly the 80s, if somebody mugged you in the street, i.e. removed items of belongings from you under threat in the street, often it wasn't taken that seriously. There were like heaps of muggings because there wasn't really any consequences then that there are now. So today, if you rob somebody in the street, then you will be done for a crime that usually has a custodial sentence applied to it, and rightfully so. But it demonstrates, doesn't it, the way that Brian sees the world. He wants to get whatever he needs and he'll get it by any means possible. Also, he managed to sign on and he received unemployment benefits at the same time as working and mugging people and stealing whatever he wanted. He was an entrepreneurial criminal, if nothing else. Also, gosh, the days where you could just sign on and get your benefits and there wasn't any computer system to coordinate the reality. And basically, they all relied in the benefits department on someone who you knew mugging you off by calling them and letting them know that you were cheating. Otherwise, that check would just keep arriving some would say the good old days. I don't know. Don't know where I am on that one. There were some good things about those times though. So by the time that Brian gets to 23, he's also really bad with his money. So he spends all his money on drugs and it's mainly weed. But again, when we're looking at the ingredients of possibility for activating problematic behaviours in certain people, particularly those predisposed to certain mental illnesses, then weed can be a big problem. And I appreciate that it can also be powerfully amazing for people with a whole heap of issues. But we have to remember that street weed and medicinal weed are two different beasts. And I do appreciate that somebody will be listening going, oh, Emma. In the 80s and 90s, weed was a lot less strong. It was, but if you have a predisposition for certain mental illnesses, it really doesn't matter. It can be highly provocative in, shall we say, extenuating the potential for that development. He was chaotic at this point, absent from work, not just for days. Apparently he'd be absent from work for weeks at a time, so he could just indulge in drug taking. So he's working in shops, but actually he's not being reliant and he's using it basically to fund his lifestyle to a degree, but only by means that works for him, i.e. if he doesn't want to go in, that's cool because he can always go and steal from somebody to get by. Also, when he is in work and they are patient with him, because bear in mind, the rights that you had when he was working at this point are not like the rights we have today. So he could have just been sacked for his behavior and he's spending weeks away and not going in and giving them any consistency. So that's bad enough, but add to that, he's stealing from his employers and ultimately that will result in him losing his job, 
rightfully so, because he has no respect. Again, what are we seeing about boundaries though? Very poor consequential understanding and certainly very poor understanding of the reality of his actions and what that can lead to. But I guess we could argue that he just doesn't respect anybody. As far as he's concerned, he likes the power, he likes the control in those environments. He really doesn't care what he loses because he can always find things elsewhere that would be able to pay for whatever he needs, no matter who it costs. I think that Brian had a really warped view of the world and probably a good example to bring in that demonstrates this is his opinion of Nisha, so the young girl that he worked with. He had this bizarre sense that she really found him attractive. He would say that she was pursuing him for sex and also that they'd have this like intimate relationship but they'd never have sex because, and just listen to how strange this description is, he said that she would rub her breasts against him, she'd feel between his legs, but if he tried to instigate anything further, she'd then become frigid and pull away and he blames her for feeling sexually frustrated because of this. Now, as soon as I looked at that in my notes, as soon as I came to that point, I realized straight away what he's saying is, he probably would go up to her, get very into her proximity, even push up against her, I imagine by a wall, and again, so her breasts are making contact, but not because she wants them to be anywhere near him, but because he's fully invaded her space. Then he's probably tried to touch her inappropriately, and she's pushed him away, and again, that's where he's suggesting that she became frigid, whereas she wasn't frigid at all, she was scared. And the problem is that the time era that we're talking about, though not millennia ago, it was still a place where often women who complained about men's sexual advances were made to look like they were being a little bit over the top, a bit dramatic, and it was just how guys are. And whilst the mass majority of men who were watching this and who we have in our lives are nothing like that, there was a certain element of male behavior that let's say wasn't the best back in the day, part of that being because there was a permission base for it. But he blames her for this. She's the one sexually frustrating him as far as he's concerned. Also, he said that another reason that there was a problem between this fantasy relationship that he never had with Nisha is that her parents didn't approve of the relationship and that they were always trying to separate them. Now, it's absolute rubbish. Her parents said that that was never true at all. In fact, not only were their daughter not actually attracted to him, It was Brian's worrying behavior that was constantly giving them cause for concern when they would leave their daughter alone in the shop with him, to the point where in the future they don't let her be alone in the shop with him. Now Nisha is also the person who notices that Brian is stealing clothes. So she tells her father. Of course she tells her father, because at the end of the day, he has absolutely no right to be taken from an employer who is paying him. Now at that point, Nisha's dad understandably confronts Brian. The same evening, after that confrontation occurs, he returns to the store. Nisha's alone there at the time, and he goes over to her and he grabs her really hard by the wrist, and he says, you big mouth. So again, Nisha is an innocent individual in this situation. Her loyalties lie with her family, not with Brian. And yet he's going back, being threatening, and also suggesting that she should have remained silent. So skewed perspective of the reality of what's playing out. Now on the 12th of March, 1993, a really strange event occurs. So Brian arrives at the store where Nisha and he did work and he basically speaks to her mother. He asks where Nisha is and her mother says, well, she's at college. And at this point he says that he's brought something for her and it's a strange scenario even for Nisha's mother because she's not used to him being kind in any way. And in this moment he produces this pretty metal box 
And Nisha's brother automatically says, where did you nick it from? And at that point, Brian doesn't say anything, but he turns the box over and he removes the label from the bottom and then he eats it. Now they all laugh at that, but when you actually stop and think about it, they weren't laughing were they? because they were kind of saying, oh, that's a really funny joke. That's a nervous laughter. So Brian's laughing for one reason, but Nisha's brother and mother, they're not. It'll be nervous, it'll be like, did that freak just eat the label that was on the box? Did that actually happen? Because that's the way that you think. But we all can relate to people like me who laugh at really inappropriate moments. You're nervous, it just happens. So when Nisha arrives back, Brian gives her this box. She opens it and there are some small flowers inside. Now, her mother had literally never seen anything like this. She'd never seen Brian behaving so nicely, so gently before, and it stood out. It really did stand out. And for me, it's the lull before the storm, this. It's this gift that actually seems to be something that is kind and compassionate and caring. But for me, it's indicative of a relationship that he thinks he's having with Nisha going on in his head that isn't based in reality. And bear in mind, we also know he's angry with her. He's angry with her because he feels that she has broken his trust and betrayed him by going to her father and telling her father that he has stolen from the shop. Literally a few days later, it's the 18th of March, 1993. Nisha's in the shop, she's working. She's just on the telephone, she's speaking to a male friend. 24 year old Brian walks in, he's armed with a claw hammer. Now, first of all, out of the blue, totally unprovoked, he attacks Nisha's younger brother, hits him on the head with the hammer. He causes a really severe laceration to Nisha's brother's head. But then the real attack occurs. He pulls Nisha away from the phone and then he just hits her several times about the head from nowhere. And he causes such severe injuries that her brain tissue was exposed. She didn't even make it to the hospital before dying. That's how seriously injured that she was. Her younger brother had to watch the whole of that horrific attack. And after Brian kills Nisha, he actually runs after her brother just wants to make sure that he kills him too, but fortunately, he manages to escape. Brian flees the scene, but some heroic individual initially chases him, recognises something terrible's happened, and he goes after him, which makes me kind of have my heart quicken because of the fact that that's a type of heroism that we rarely see in these crimes. Somebody willing to put themselves on the line chasing an armed individual who's just murdered somebody, but doing it because it's the right thing to do. Now, sadly, that particular individual loses him, but then he's spotted. Brains found in a block of flats in Battersea and he's hanging from the third floor walkway. He's hanging by his fingertips. So basically what he's done is he's realised during that run, after knowing that he's needlessly and without any reason murdered that poor defenceless 20 year old girl, he realises he's probably going to spend the rest of his life in prison. So he decides that he's going to throw himself over head first and kill himself. But you know how it can be, guys. That survival instinct just kicks in. And suddenly, as he's going over, he has second thoughts and he just clings on. But when you're hanging and you've only got your fingertips hanging on there, you're not going to be able to remain there and eventually falls. He falls some 40 feet. He badly breaks his legs and ankles, but he survives. So he lives to tell the tale. When they take him to hospital, because obviously he's quite seriously injured at this point, one of the things that the physicians and the nurses note about him is that he just keeps repeating this telephone number and he's going over and over again, just telling them the same number. 
and the nurse writes it down in the end and when the police come along and look and are given this particular number they're able to trace it back to the fact that it's Nisha's parents so it's like he wants to contact them when Nisha's mother Rashmi is interviewed by the police later down the line she is able to say look there was on reflection some really worrying behavior that I'd seen about Brian over the previous few months but she hadn't added it all together she'd noticed it had worried her and she talked about it to people but it had never felt like one incident was so outstandingly dramatic that it caused her to believe this kind of thing could happen but now she'd seen the results of what he'd done in killing her daughter she recognizes that adding them all together was indeed what she wished she'd been able to do First of all, he often changed his appearance and sometimes he'd shave his hair, sometimes he'd grow his beard. His personal hygiene went seriously downhill. Remember with mental illness, people often struggle with their personal self-care and hygiene. She also said that at times, even though his personal hygiene seemed to be sliding, he occasionally smelt like he was washing his face in disinfectant. She noticed that he'd mumble incoherently to himself. He'd speak in a language that no one else could understand. It just seemed to make sense to him. But one of the big things that she noticed was that he began carrying a claw hammer around. Now that claw hammer was from the toolbox in the basement of the shop. Every time she saw him with it, when he put it down, she'd just go and put it away. But he'd just reappear with it. And on one occasion he expressed to her that he wanted to kill somebody and she said even though at the time she believed that this was just fantasy this was just him being ridiculous and making these suggestions just to get a reaction there was something about the way he looked that scared her but even worse than that so bear in mind this is a woman that's employing him and Brian becomes physically aggressive to her on one occasion he kicks her in the shins he hits her in the lower legs with a belt buckle and she is so upset by this she starts to call the police and he disconnects the call and then runs away from the shop he'd also told her that one of the things that was really easy in east london was to mug pakistanis he said that they never tried to fight back which with respect guys if you're being mugged is a really sensible thing not to do so I only have ultimate respect for people who are getting mugged in a street robbery and don't think it's worth risking their life in that situation but you can understand that that's really worrying behavior and it's certainly worrying to communicate that to your employer she expressed concerns to her husband as well but he just didn't believe her in fact, he believed that Brian was always very polite and very respectful around him. And that annoys me greatly. I understand that culturally people have different ways of acting and being in relationships. I do understand as well that in certain communities and cultures, women are not necessarily valued in the same way as men. I'm not saying that that's the case here. I'm just saying that if I came home and was like, you know, the guy that we employ, he assaulted me with a belt today, he said he wants to kill somebody and basically hurt me and then when I tried to ring the police, he wouldn't let me and he ran from the shop. I wouldn't have got to the end of the first sentence before my husband would have left my home trying to track him down and hunt him. Obviously, we'd have mobile interaction and intervention and I'd call him back and calm him down, but that's what would happen. And I think a lot of you will feel that frustration that when somebody is saying, look, this guy has done A, B and C and they're just not being heard. And when we think about the consequences of what happened to poor Nisha, she should have been believed. Her mother should have been believed and she wasn't. Now, the reason that it's alleged that Brian went ahead and killed Nisha is because he said that he felt very angry about the fact that she told her parents that he'd been stealing from the shop. To be honest with you, that could be a reason. But as we talk further about Brian, I think that he would just create a reason to kill somebody. It was his desire to kill that trumps anybody's actions towards him. You know, Nisha could have been given an opportunity in his mind to be killed because she betrayed him. But 
I don't think it would have been difficult for him to pick an argument with anyone on anything or just even to act out as we've seen before in literally trying to throw somebody out of a sixth floor window in an unprovoked attack. But I understand that that's what they believe was the reasoning behind him attacking her. So whatever his motivation was, again, one of the things that we're seeing play out is this violent behavior towards females again. And his warped view of events just carry on. So when he's interviewed by the police and he has to describe Nisha's killing, it really makes no sense. So I'm gonna go through what he says so that you can hear just how nonsensical it is. So according to Brian, he enters the shop and Nisha starts kissing him and says, make me, rape me in an intimidating manner. Instantly, I'm gonna take issue with that because somebody asking you to rape them is not gonna do that in an intimidating manner. It's literally a polarity, simple as that. The rapist is the intimidator, per se. He also claims that when she says this, he just couldn't believe what she was saying. But from that, he gets this strong impression that she wants him to kill her. Yeah, so now he's blaming her for what happens. And it just so happens that he had a hammer with him. This is literally what he tells the police. So it just so happens he had a hammer with him. I appreciate it, guys. We've all been there, haven't we? Walking around the house, where are my keys? Where's my lip liner? Where's my bag? Where's my credit card? Oh, where's my claw hammer? Happens to the best of us. Totally, totally appreciate it. Said no one ever, unless they're a DIY person or a builder. You know, this just does not make sense, but this is what he's saying. And then he says, when he began striking her with the hammer, she just stood there and took it. Yeah, just stood there and took it, as you would. Somebody smashes you around the head with a hammer. You're just gonna be like, yeah, just do it again. No big deal. I mean, delusional, clearly. He says that she didn't tell him to stop, just looked it into his eyes. Again, that's not gonna happen if you just smash somebody around the head with a hammer because they're either gonna be unconscious in absolute agony or completely disorientated and confused. They're not gonna be staring into your eyes. But he does remember that during this relentless, brutal, horrific attack, she had managed to tell him to jump off a building at some point during the attack. Multiple witnesses discredit all of this. They said Nisha was absolutely terrified that she screamed, that she attempted to fend him off and that she had defense wounds because of that deadly assault and how she tried her best to fight him off. And again, think about Nisha in this moment. She is this young girl, whole life ahead of her, loved, good family, everything to live for. And in this moment of macabre, despicable brutality, she's killed by a man who with respect had been given every opportunity by her family. Brian firstly goes to hospital, of course, because he needs to heal from his horrible injuries from falling 40 feet. And when he's then moved to Brixton prison, he goes ahead again with his delusions regarding Nisha and he writes a letter to Nisha's father of all the people in the world who would never want to hear from that man again, it would be Nisha's father. But yeah, he just goes ahead. And I'm gonna tell you what he says because I think that it shows you a detachment from reality. He says, I'm writing to tell you how very, very, very sorry I am. I would have liked to have been part of your family, but due to this situation, this does not look possible. Telling Nisha that I love her over and over again just does not work. If there's a problem with the color of me, you are selling yourself too cheap. So if you would be so kind to send my clothes to HM Prison Jeb Avenue, Brixton, London, I would be very, very, very happy. In my mind, Nisha will always live and sooner or later, I will meet her. And no one can tell me to keep away from my daughter. Good luck. So you can hear. It makes literally no sense whatsoever, but he has conceived that that is an appropriate communication to have 
with this poor grieving man whose daughter he has murdered. Also, whilst he's in Brixton prison, his behaviour sucks. It's really bad. He's in a wheelchair, remember, at this point. So if ever there is a point where you were at a disadvantage in the prison population, it's when you're in a wheelchair. And yet, in spite of this, he launches two completely unprovoked attacks on other inmates whilst he's there. And that demonstrates, again, lack of consequential thinking. He isn't concerned about his impact. He's already in there for such a serious crime, and yet, as opposed to behaving himself, he's just reacting really badly and being violent. Then we get to December 1993. This signals the start of what would be years, to be honest, of continuous assessment and continuing treatment at various mental health facilities that are secure, obviously, because he's considered very dangerous. And the whole aim of this treatment is to basically get him back to be reintegrated into society. They want to sort his condition out, meet his needs, make him safe. And the whole premise of that treatment is to make sure that when he is ultimately released, he's not going to pose a risk to the public. Which worries me a little bit, even though I know we should always believe in reparation, restoration. We should believe that people can make amends. We should definitely believe that they can be rehabilitated. There are some people that I think, hmm, maybe we shouldn't take a chance. Maybe we should be like, you know what? We should just keep them locked up somewhere perfectly reasonable, where they have their needs met, but where they may not go out and murder other people. Just throwing it out there. It's just a suggestion. Why take a risk? But he's sent to Rampton High Secure Hospital. This is under Section 35 of the Mental Health Act 1983. Apparently, whilst he is there, he told the staff that he felt good whilst killing. Honestly, I, I know, I get it, I know. It's all about treatment and if you can treat somebody and they can get rid of those feelings and they can acknowledge the impact that they've had and be accountable and responsible and the mental illness can be treated and all those things that go hand in hand, I appreciate there may be occasion where people can move forward positively. But I have to say, if I was working there and he's like, oh yeah, yeah, I feel good when I kill people. I would like have a file that whenever anybody opened in great big red letters stamped over all the notes, it would just have never release. That may sound judgmental, but I think, who am I here to protect right now? Am I here to protect an individual who's already murdered, mindlessly killed without conscience, has been violent in prison, has tried to throw a guy out of a sixth floor window? And on top of that is now telling people that he feels good whilst killing? Or am I there to protect members of the public? Anyway, he remains at Rampton High Secure until July 2001. They describe him during that period of time as being an absolute model patient. They said he generally came across as very calm, amiable, a really nice individual. And then after he spent time there, he's moved for six months to the John Howard Centre. Now, the John Howard Centre is a medium secure unit in Hackney. He's then conditionally discharged to a place called Riverside House. He spends the next two years there, and that's basically a 24-hour supervised forensic hostel in London. But even though it is a supervised forensic hostel in London, it does basically mark his release back into the community full-time. So that means that the psychiatrists and the mental health workers that had been working with him were without doubt satisfied he was no longer a risk to the public. Now, what worries me about those decisions, and I genuinely think I have a right to these worries, is that at this point, it was only around eight years after he had brutally murdered Nisha with a claw hammer. Does that sound long to you? Because if somebody without a mental illness had done exactly the same and been convicted of murder, they would have served a lot longer, a lot longer. Don't get me wrong. 
What I'm not trying to do here is compare someone who kills during a mental illness episode to someone who doesn't. I know it's different. The fault element is very different. But for me, it just feels like his release didn't take full account of his really serious antisocial personality disorder. It's shining through. I appreciate that it's meant to have been really calm and well behaved, but come on, this guy has a serious antisocial personality disorder. We can see from his entire life, there has been a serious degree of malice in his personality eventuating to murder. And yet it seems like in a matter of months, he's gone from a high security hospital to a hostel where he's free to just come and go. Personally, I think it's a really fast transition. I think it's a really bad mistake. And I can't understand the legitimate decision that was clearly made in that moment, as far as they were concerned with the evidence that they had, that this seems like a plan of action that is transitioned gradually to a point where the public are not gonna be at risk. It doesn't seem like that's happened. It feels like it's been incredibly fast it's occurred incredibly quickly. And I don't know, maybe they are holding him up as a beacon of look what we can do with these violent offenders. We can stabilize their mental illness and then we can put them into the community and they're gonna be fine. But I don't buy into it. I think that was a super fast transition and I don't think it's one that would ever have been safe. Also, when I was doing my research, I realized that one of the big problems that we have in the release of him to that hostel is that his supervising psychiatrist had literally never been responsible for a killer before. Now, I know everyone has to have their first experience of being responsible for something in their job that they've never done before, I get it. But do we really put somebody like Brian with a psychiatrist who's never actually worked with a killer before? Because I would much rather have a jaded died in the wall forensic psych or clinical psych or psychiatrist who realistically has seen it and been it and done it all before and therefore is a little bit less impulsive and ready to believe that miracles have been performed. And to add to that, Brian's social worker was later described as very inexperienced and I'm sure that they were qualified as a social worker, no disrespect to them, but they had absolutely no training in mental health. None. With a guy who took a claw hammer to an innocent girl, they put him with a social worker with no understanding or training in mental health. It's during this time he remains under the supervision of the community psychiatric nurse, don't get me wrong, so there is some kind of contact and support. And that psychiatric nurse did say that Brian was one of the most compliant service users that they'd ever come across. Again, this very calm, amiable guy. However, he's been resident at this particular hostel for just coming up for two years. And one day he goes and admits himself voluntarily. So he voluntarily does this, he's not sectioned, he goes in of his own volition to a psychiatric ward at Newham Centre for Mental Health. This is in February 2004. Allegedly, the reasoning behind this is because it was a week after he assaulted a 17-year-old girl. Now, we all know what his history is like. The inappropriate assaults on girls, also the murder of a female and the attack on that female's mother, all of these things introduce us to a man who is hands-on with women. And he goes into the hospital saying that he basically just blew a couple of raspberries on her stomach. What? Sorry? She's 17. She's not two. And even then you'd need permission of the parents to do such a thing. So the idea that he is like, oh, you know what, all I did was blow a few raspberries on her stomach. So that would mean that you were pinning her down, you were exposing her flesh, and then you were blowing raspberries on her bare belly. That would be what we would be introduced to if that were the case. But of course, that isn't just the case. But that in itself is bloody terrifying when you think about Brian and his personality. 
But according to that 17 year old, it's very different. It was a sustained assault. It happened in several rooms of a parent's flat. He was continually grabbing her. Him, she was hitting him, she was fighting him off. And eventually she did have the wherewithal and thank God the strength to push him out of the front door. But numerous times, whilst he was attacking and assaulting her, he was warning her, you don't know what I'm capable of. And that's clearly showing us that aggression and hostility that's within him all the time, calm exterior or otherwise, this is what lies beneath. Now he gets advised that he has to move from the hostel as well at this point because it turns out he picked the wrong family. And again, going back a few decades, let's say societal retribution was something that did occur. If the police wouldn't sort it, somebody else would sort it. And this girl's family is like, you either get away from us, you get away from being near my girl, or our whole other type of justice is gonna play out when we get our hands on you. So he needs to vacate the premises. He ends up remaining on the psychiatric ward for a week. And during that time, bear in mind, he's a voluntary patient, not section, so to some degree he has freedom to come and go. And he just assures the staff that he's feeling miles better, his state of mind's improved considerably. And because he's this informal patient, he's allowed to leave the hospital whenever he wishes. Should be noted, by the way, because I do want to bring in at least a position of balance, because what I'm going to talk about next is it's excruciating, it's horrifying. But just to give the services that were meant to be supporting and making sure that he wasn't acting in a way that was problematic for the community, it had been 11 years since Brian had killed Nisha and he hadn't at that point during that period displayed any violent or aggressive behaviour. So up until this point where we're starting to see a decline in the way that he's treated that 17 year old, he has been the poster boy for progression within the psychiatric arena that he's been in. He's one of those individuals that I guess they're holding up as an icon of possibility. And like I said, there's been no violence that's been notable. But then we get to the morning of the 17th of February, 2004. Brian asks the hospital staff if it's okay, if he can leave the ward, he wants to go out for a few hours. At that point, he presents to the medical professionals as someone who's just not mentally unwell at all. So gets to 3 p.m., he's been given permission, leaves the hospital and everyone just expects that he's going to go out for a few hours and return. Because, of course, Brian isn't a threat. Brian is an example of good practice. He's somebody who's thriving to some degree, even knowing when to ask for additional support, as he had at that hospital that week. But it turns out that there was something much darker going on in Brian's mind. There was something much deeper running through his veins as he left that hospital at 3 p.m. Because it turns out the day before, he'd actually sent a letter to a fellow patient. It arrived the next day. And believe me, it gave insight into his intentions when he left hospital that day. It stated he still had his ace to play. And wow. It would soon transpire that his state of mind had most definitely not improved. And before I go on to talk about the crime that played out, remember this. Serial killers lie in wait. A cooling off period is what defines a serial killer. An individual who can take weeks, months, years, even decades without killing because they live with the fantasy in their head. The fantasy is enough to ignite what they need to thrive in their mind with the idea of the possibilities that they will use to harm another person in the future. They don't always need to go ahead and do it. Many serial killers have had long cooling off periods. So he sets off. He sets off to see his friend, 
43 year old Brian Cherry. He's going to his flat in Walthamstow, North London. For people in the UK, Walthamstow, pretty famous for spawning the band E17. For those of you in other countries, you'll be like, isn't that a postcode? You'd be right. It's Walthamstow's postcode, in fact. But nonetheless, irrelevant. I digress. It was a band. Had a number one at Christmas once. Anyway, he goes to Walthamstow and he goes to visit Brian Cherry, who all of Brian Cherry's neighbours said was a really kind, nice man, but he was lonely. He was vulnerable. He didn't have any friends. In fact, the friends that he had, they just took advantage of him. And he had met Brian Cherry through a mutual acquaintance. And this mutual acquaintance was a woman who was drug dependent and she would go around to Brian Cherry's and she'd basically get money off him and it would help her fund her drug habit and then she'd go back to his flat to use drugs. And that indicates, doesn't it, the kind of guy that Brian Cherry is. He's desperate. He'll be used by people. He'll allow people to exploit him, but at least if it gives him some company, then that's better than being by himself. So for Brian, well, Brian Cherry is the perfect victim, isn't he? He's available and he's vulnerable. And at the end of the day, that excites Brian because if he wants to find a victim, he wants to find a victim that he has time to hurt. And he's clearly planning something diabolical because as he's going to Brian Cherry's flat, he stops, he buys a claw hammer, a Stanley knife and a screwdriver. He gets to Brian Cherry's flat around 6 p.m. and genuinely, shortly after Brian Cherry's dead. And the killing, at least the initial part of it, echoes the earlier killing. He beats Brian Cherry around the head with a claw hammer. But then, he takes those tools that he's purchased earlier, a Stanley knife and a screwdriver, and he dismembers his friend's body. I mean, for those of you who've seen films like Scarface, we all know it would be horrific enough to use something like an electric saw to dismember someone. But a claw hammer? A Stanley knife? Okay, I get that a Stanley knife is really sharp, but the blade is so small. And a screwdriver? I mean, it's unimaginably brutal. And imagine walking into a flat where that kind of dismemberment has taken place. It would be like an abattoir. It'd be like a slaughterhouse. And then if that's not enough, he then removes some of the exposed brain from Brian Cherry's head he walks over to the stove, he gets a frying pan, he puts butter in the frying pan, and then he fries some of the brain matter and he eats it. The killing itself that I've just described is just heinous and utterly barbaric. But the fact that he cannibalizes Brian Cherry, and I am describing one of the most horrific scenes that we can imagine. So when you think about how Brian would have been prior to this, you probably have lots of ideas about the kind of behavior that he'd be exhibiting. But what I'm gonna tell you later about what his behavior was like immediately prior to the murder, I genuinely think that you'll find it even more terrifying than what you potentially even imagine. But we'll talk about that later on. Now, later that same evening, around 7.15 p.m., that young female drug addict that Brian had been introduced to Brian Cherry by, well, she arrives at the flat. She's there to collect some cigarettes. Also, she wants some money off Brian Cherry because she wants to go and score her drugs. As she arrives at the door, she says she's hit with a smell of really strong disinfectant. And the door's open, so she pushes it further. And then she sees... Peter Bryan. And she notices straight away he's not wearing any clothes on his upper body. Also, at that point, she says she noticed he was sweating, he's holding a kitchen knife. And she automatically says, like, where's Brian? Where's Brian Cherry, the guy who lives here and who I'm gonna get my cigarettes off and drugs off? And he just says to her at that point, leave. 
She asks again, and he just says straight to her, Ryan Cherry is dead. She then averts her eyes past him. She looks around. She looks past him into the front room. And she can't believe what she sees. A naked body with a dismembered arm lying nearby. Now, she is not stupid. She is street smart. She knows in that moment she is playing with her life. Her very survival depends on the way that she acts in this moment and she acts well. She calmly acts naturally and just claims that she has to go and she just walks away and then she runs. She informs the police. When the police arrive, they have no idea what they're about to walk into. They find Brian, he's covered in dried blood in the dark hallway. Also, they find Brian Cherry's totally dismembered body, his arms, one of his legs has been hacked off. And it's established later down the line that he was struck at least 24 times on the head with that hammer. His head was also partially sewn off. He had both of his hands broken because he'd had those broken when he'd been trying to fend off the attack. And then, of course, the police officers go and look in the kitchen and they cannot believe what they are seeing. There's brain tissue and hair matted with blood and it's all heaped on a plate next to a knife and fork on the draining board. And then on the cooker, they see the frying pan and in it, they can see some of the victim's brains. And when they actually go ahead and they charge Brian with murder, he stated, I ate his brains with butter. It was really nice. Again, what are we being introduced to there? We're being introduced to somebody who is feeling powerful and dominant. I know we can argue mental illness on top of this. I appreciate that his actions are not rational or normal, but he's taking joy in what he's achieved. You see, for me, I think this antisocial personality disorder is what trumps everything else. You know, people who are murderers are also sometimes mentally ill. People who are billionaires are also people who are sometimes mentally ill. You can't use mental illness as a reason for people to go ahead and do these horrible things. The vast, 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 vast majority of people with mental illnesses just go about their daily lives being good human beings, probably only putting themselves at risk occasionally. They aren't individuals full of malice. And Brian is. Now, when the news gets out that there is this horrific cannibal slaying, essentially, the press decide that they need to come up with a moniker. You'll be aware of this, BTK, the Night Stalker. They love to give a title because one, it makes people afraid and that's important that people have a level of fear when there are these horrible crimes playing out because it makes you be a bit more vigilant about your own safety. So they decide to title this cannibalistic killer with the name Peckish Pete. I kid you not. I'm imagining in the Daily Mail offices, the group meeting in the morning, everyone sat around, somebody is giving the information to the editor, well, there's been this horrible cannibalistic slaying, this guy's murdered before, he's therefore a serial killer now, and he ate the brain matter of his last victim. I'm thinking about the cannibal who's an animal, or the torturing cannibal, or the claw hammer cannibal. You know, something like that. Yeah, yeah, let's just, I like it, but I don't love it. Let's just ask around the womb. Anybody else? Who are you? New boy in the corner. Oh, yeah, you're the YTS. You're the new starter. You're the male boy. Great. Got any ideas? What's that? Peckish Pete. I like it. Peckish Pete. Because he didn't eat all the brains. So he wasn't full up Pete. He was just a bit peckish. You're getting promoted. Someone let him sort the photocopying or something. Genuinely peckish Pete. Did they think, let's go for a cartoon character. 
let's think about a nice character in a children's book. Ooh, Peckish Pete's been in and ate all the chocolate biscuits. Peckish Pete is not relatable to a cannibalistic murderer. A little bit frustrated, digressed a little bit there, went into some kind of weird amdram. You know what I'm saying though. Anyway, that's what the press talk about him in that respect. Now, according to the officers that investigated this case, other than the fact that he actually dismembered somebody and had eaten their brains, when they arrested him, he was really calm. He displayed absolutely no signs of mental illness. However, when they actually got him in the police van and they were kind of waiting to transport him, he did turn around to the police and say, I wanted his soul. A lot of people might think that that's directly indicative of mental illness because, of course, you cannot consume somebody's soul. But let me draw your attention to other killers. Jeffrey Dahmer said he wanted to possess them. Dennis Nielsen, he wanted to possess his victims. He wanted them to become part of him. Samuel Little fully believed he was going to meet all the women that he murdered in the afterlife, apart from he didn't realise that whilst there are lifts up and down, that he's straight down to an incredibly hot place for eternity. So he's not going to be doing that. But nonetheless, it is common with serial killers that they have this arrogant superior belief system that they are godlike and therefore the victims that they murder become part of them and that there is this ownership over them. So again, we can say mental illness, but we can also bring in that antisocial personality disorder that's playing out in a very serious way with the potential of wanting to possess, consume his victims for them to become ultimately part of him. Also, during the interrogation with the police, Brian admits that he's really comforted by the smell of blood. <sighs> Now again, this sounds like it could be serious mental decline, delusional. Let me draw your attention back to a case that I covered before on the Gary Allen serial killer case. Gary Allen was absolutely fixated with blood running into water. He loved watching blood run into water. He was not insane. It was that malevolent killer within him that liked seeing that. So again, there are some parallels there. It doesn't have to just be that he's dealing with delusions in this moment. He could genuinely feel comforted by the smell of blood. And when it comes down to him describing what it was like to dismember Brian Cherry's body, which for all of us listening now, we will feel repulsed. It creates aversion as it should. For him, he just says, I used a Stanley knife to cut them off and some other kitchen knives, but I had to stamp on them to break the bone. So that's how physical he got with the body. He wanted to pull it apart. And when he couldn't use implements and knives and the tools that he took, he just literally used his own brute force to snap the bones. It's outside the realm of normal human conditioning and understanding to comprehend that kind of violence. Now his plan as well was that he was going to dispose of the body piece by piece and this is because he didn't want to get caught initially he had made a decision that one more kill was not enough you know he didn't just want a total of two people that he'd murdered he wanted to kill eight people it was really important to him that he became known as a serial killer keep that in mind as well this is a guy admitting he's comforted by the smell of blood who is quite happy to get hands on disemboweling and deconstructing a human body with plans to just remove that body and dump it places so we can carry on who is saying I haven't killed enough bear that in mind for what I'm going to talk about soon also he had another belief that he kind of expressed that he felt was really normal it was like cannibalism what's that no problem it's just a delicacy that not everybody has tried some people like beef some people like kangaroo some people like buffalo some people eat insects cannibalism is just an extra layer on you know those kind of delicacies that not everyone's into and he actually said he'd have liked a bigger victim because a bigger victim would have been more of a challenge i mean cannibalism 
at the end of the day, we've got the plant burger now, haven't we? At Burger King, we've got the muck plant over at McDonald's. I guess, you know, they are catering for a whole host of different ideas around food. And I mean, why not have a cannibal burger? Honestly, it's so weird that he feels this way and that he feels so at peace expressing that he's comfortable with this. Now, within an hour, of killing his friend, that's when he's arrested by the police. And like I've said to you, he remained completely calm. He exhibited absolutely no signs of psychosis. And he's assessed by a psychiatrist. And after he's assessed by the psychiatrist, and this is immediately after, he is declared fit to be interviewed by the police. I'm telling you that so you can understand that this crime has played out and yet his demeanor seems completely okay to be interviewed and interrogated. So he's not presenting as having a severe mental illness in this moment. Ultimately, and quite obviously, is charged with the murder of Brian Cherry at this point. Initially, he gets sent to Pentonville Prison. He gets sent there to await trial, but he then gets moved to Belmarsh Prison. It's at this point we do see that his mental state begins to deteriorate and he gets more and more unpredictable. And it feels like particularly with regard to Belmarsh, he gets involved in quite a lot of violent incidents. So just to go through a few of those, on the 8th of March, 2004, punches an officer. Then on the 12th of March, 2004, they find a noose in his cell. So again, we get some insight that he was potentially feeling suicidal. On the 19th of March, 2004, he says he wants to hit the officer he's previously punched. I'm like that poor officer, like, why me? Why me? There are other officers. Why doesn't he want to punch another officer? What's wrong with your face? So I'd feel anyway. And on the 20th of March, 2004, he does assault a member of staff when he's returning from a shower. And then on the 23rd of March, 2004, he sets fire to his cell. I am imagining it was still legal to smoke in prisons at this point because I'm like otherwise how on earth do you get fire into a cell but you can see the mental decline happening you know his behavior is becoming more and more chaotic so on the 15th of april 2004 brian gets transferred to broadmoor hospital now i have some cynicism in my mind there is a little bit of a cynic in me all the time call me jaded Maybe I've lost a little bit of my idealism. All I'm saying is, this guy has been at secure mental facilities before and he's coped really well. He's been there for a period of, you know, over eight years. He's an individual who has thrived, been considered a very model patient. He's not been problematic. So if he wants to get to another facility that is gonna be a secure mental health facility, maybe demonstrating psychological and psychiatric decline would be helpful. I'm just saying it's a possibility. He's a high level manipulator without a doubt, this guy. You can see that by his behavior in the past. I mean, this is a guy who gets what he wants. He pushes for what he wants. He bullies for what he wants. He takes what he wants. He kills what he wants. It's not too big a stretch of the imagination that he decides that if he acts a certain way, the likelihood is his mental health becomes such an issue that he will be moved to a secure facility that is a mental health facility. And he ends up at Broadmoor, which for those of you who aren't in the UK, is the high security facility for the criminally insane. And it's probably one of the most famous institutes in the UK in that regard, because it's housed some really infamous characters. That includes Charles Bronson, it includes serial killers like Robert Knapper, Robert Maudsley. So these are really dangerous people, really dangerous. In particular, people like Robert Maudsley. So you think when you look at Brian and his personality and his behavior, he's gonna be on a level with these kind of individuals, but no, 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 no. The likes of people like Ian Brady, another Broadmoor inmate, they're not on par, apparently, with Brian. The pre-admission social work report concluded that Brian presented an extremely high-risk patient. 
and that was compared to other Broadmoor patients. So I mean, when you're looking at Broadmoor inpatients and you're thinking about the whole heap of wrong regarding many of those people, he trumps them all. And that report, well, it wasn't wrong. Because although Brian's now incarcerated, you know, supervised 24 seven, his killing spree's not over. Because just days later, days later, on the 25th of April, 2004, he attacks 59 year old Richard Loudwell. Richard Loudwell was a patient on his ward and the attack happens in an unobserved dining room. I know, let's just take that sentence for a minute and go, what the hell? The guy's attacked in an unobserved dining room. Hmm, what do dining rooms often have in them apart from tables? I don't know, knives and forks potentially? Why is it unobserved? Somebody tell me that. Anyway, turns out that this Loudwell is apparently selected because he'd sexually assaulted and strangled an 82 year old called Joan Smith in 2002. And let's be honest, Loudwell is a reprehensible excuse for a human being who should absolutely be behind closed doors and not be allowed to be in our streets to literally strangle and sexually assault an elderly pensioner is absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, unforgivable. But Brian's in there after murdering an innocent girl and literally totally decimating the body of somebody that was a friend after murdering him and eating some of him. He's hardly the beacon of morality, the poster boy of good behavior. But the reason that Loudwell had essentially provoked, as far as Brian is concerned, this reaction is that people knew about his crime. So when Loudwell became a resident at Broadmoor, he immediately disclosed his offence. That was within hours. And that caused, from the get-go, huge problems. So he got lots of minor assaults occur towards him. He was spat at. He was verbally abused. He had ash thrown on him. And this is indicative of what happens if you are a sex offender who murders somebody vulnerable, often the result is this kind of abuse. Although again, it's so ironic when you think about people like Brady, who is in there, a man who literally murdered children in the most heinous and torturous ways. But arguably, Loudwell is one of those people that stands out as more vulnerable than these other heinous humans. The day he is actually attacked as well, there were nine staff on duty. Turns out Brian had been planning the attack. Remember what he said? He wanted to kill eight people. He wanted to be a serial killer. And he'd just been lying in wait, just waiting for the opportunity. And all the other inmates, they knew. They were aware that some kind of attack was gonna happen. They didn't speak to the nurses about it. They didn't let security know about it. They just knew that something was gonna play out and they let it play out. So first of all, Brian tries to strangle Loudwell. He uses the cord from his tracksuit bottoms. And then when that isn't working, he just takes Loudwell's head and he just smashes it again and again onto the table, onto the floor. It's a really sustained attack. It lasted several minutes, high level attack. He goes on after the attack and he's reflecting on this to tell a nurse, I got him from behind. I put a ligature around his neck so that he couldn't make a noise and I smashed his head. And if that scene isn't horrific enough to describe anyway, then just imagine this. During that attack, other patients who knew it was gonna occur allegedly sang Lazy Sunday Afternoon by the small faces to cover the noise. I mean, to me, that makes them more complicit. They enjoyed watching that play out. Every single one of those individuals who stood by and sang that song, well, it says a lot about rehabilitation, doesn't it? 
It says a lot about, you know, the work going on regarding accountability and responsibility by those individuals. And I know that people believe in righteous justice. I know that people have a warped idea about sex attackers and what needs to happen to them. Hell, a lot of us feel those feelings ourselves at times when we hear about these heinous crimes, but we're talking about these patients being criminally insane and often having carried out far worse killings than even the one that Loudwell carried out. Brian also told staff that if he'd had more time, well, he would have liked to have eaten him. Yeah, just pity I didn't have another 15 minutes. Pity they wouldn't have a camping stove. If only there'd been some catering facilities around when I'd murdered this guy, because I wouldn't have half of loved a snack. Anyway, later tells the police this. I get these urges, you see. I've had these urges ever since I saw him. He's the bottom of the food chain, old and haggard. He looked like he'd had his innings. I was just waiting for my chance to get at him. I wanted to kill him and eat him. I didn't have much time. If I did, I'd have tried to cook him and to eat him. Ugh. Again, really doesn't concern himself with who he's telling. He's just telling the police this. Yeah, would have liked a bit more time. You know, maybe some effective knives. Just some platters available. Maybe a salad with it. I don't know. Sweet potato fries, probably. Slightly healthier than fries. At the end of the day, he just doesn't care what people think about him, does he? He just has no moral conscience about the reality of what he's carried out. And the fact that he calls him the lowest of the food chain, he's not talking about animals in comparison there. He's talking about humans. So he's looking at humans as all possibly edible and that this particular individual is the lowest of the low on that food chain. And because he's weak and vulnerable, he's the easiest to slay. Now, Loudwell actually died. Even though he survived for six weeks, his injuries were so severe that he passed away on the 5th of June 2004. So Brian then gets charged with a second murder. He goes on to tell police that this one wasn't just about murdering and ideally wanting to consume, he got some real sexual satisfaction from it. Instead, he said that when he killed people, that was something that really connected for him, that he felt a sexual satisfaction. And in relation to Loudwell, he actually claimed that he wanted to shag him whilst he was alive and also when he was dead. Domination, power, is motivating him, it's sexually titillating him to know that he has this control that's what really turns him on and the one thread that we've had throughout all of this killer's profile is this constant inappropriateness sexually from very early years when they are coming to trial they need to look at assessing brian properly and it's not hard for them to assess that as far as they're concerned, he's been seriously mentally ill when he did the two murders. And the prosecution don't argue with this. They accept the diagnosis. They do believe that Brian was not in his right mind when he murdered the two individuals. So Brian then subsequently pleads not guilty to murder on the grounds of diminished responsibility. Now the law that this involves is actually changed now. But at the time we're talking, it was at the time of the Homicide Act 1957. And the Homicide Act 1957, it provided this special defence to murder. And this special defence had to fit this. It had to be provided that at the time of the killing, the defendant could show that they were suffering from an abnormality of mind that substantially impaired their mental responsibility for their acts. And if that was pleaded successfully, the defendant would avoid the murder conviction. Instead, they would be convicted of voluntary manslaughter. According to the psychiatric assessments that were done on Brian, he was suffering from paranoid schizophrenia and a personality disorder at the time of the killings. However, it was also noted that Brian's was a really unusual case of mental illness because the typical symptoms of schizophrenia are such that the sufferer normally actually appears to be seriously mentally unwell when they're going into a decline. 
they have symptoms like visual and auditory hallucinations. So that is when you actually physically hear and see things that look very real to you, but no one else can see. You might have delusional beliefs. So you might think that the whole world is against you. You might believe that your partner is an alien. You might feel that people or things are coming to get you and it can feel very, very real. Often you'll socially withdraw, so your family and friends won't see you because you'll just kind of remove yourself from society. And another thing is that poor personal hygiene. And we did know that Brian had experienced in the past, but aside from the hygiene, he hadn't done any of those other things or evidence that any of those things were something he was experiencing. And so when they look at him, he genuinely didn't exhibit any of those symptoms, in fact, prior to each of the killings. In fact, his behaviour was seen as completely normal. Now, bear in mind, he was clearly seriously mentally unwell, according to the psychiatrist, and certainly his behaviour is indicative of it. And I guess that when you think of Brad Bryan, that is what makes him wholly and terrifyingly so dangerous. Because apparently, according to the reports and the psychiatrists, from the study of Brian's mental illness, he would have been acting completely normally before he killed the people he killed. So literally no physical symptoms of a paranoid schizophrenic episode. He was not agitated, physically aggressive, for example. They're things that we often see when people are having a really difficult schizophrenic episode. And there would also have been no apparent mental symptoms. So he wouldn't have looked confused. He wouldn't have seemed paranoid. And this, I think, is really highlighted when we look back at the 1987 attack, when he just tried to throw some innocent man from a sixth floor window. I mean, that victim said the attack was wholly unprovoked. And I believe that that was the case. I believe that that poor man was going about his business and Brian just went over to him and tried to throw him out of a sixth floor window. So Brian likely just went from being calm to trying to hurl into his death with absolutely no warning and it's actually terrifying to also imagine what it would have been like for brian cherry cherry would have probably opened the door to him been cordial to him invited him in offered him a cup of tea or coffee just thought his mate had come around remember brian cherry was a lonely person so brian walking in was probably a bit of a godsend for him and he was going to enjoy his company he would have had no warning whatsoever of what was about to unfold. Brian would have switched from normal to caving his head in with a claw hammer. Then using the same claw hammer and Stanley knife and screwdriver to dismember him. And then if that wasn't enough, going ahead and eating part of his brain, frying it with butter and saying how nice it was. So he basically went from this really normal guy to other people's perspectives at least, to a really far from normal, absolute monster without any warning. From this seemingly rational individual to murder, mutilation and cannibalism. And Brian Cherry was his friend. I mean, he wouldn't have stood a chance. He would not have stood a chance. And this is also unusual that the aggressive and violent behaviour that's associated with Brian's mental illness hadn't actually manifested for such a long time. Bear in mind his first killing was in 1993. He had been an absolute model patient for the seven and a half years that he was at Rampton Hospital. And it wasn't until 2004 that he killed Brian Cherry. But like I said, bear in mind, serial killers can also be mentally ill. Maybe Brian was just very patient. On the 15th of March, 2005, Brian was sentenced at the Old Bailey. Now, as he had been convicted of a previous serious offense in the past, under the provision of the two strikes rule, the judge imposed an automatic life sentence in respect for each homicide, which is obviously very good practice. You know, we let this murderer walk free once 
And you know what he did? He murdered somebody else. Hmm, let's have a think about that. I don't think we should do a third time lucky situation here. I think we should just maybe just keep him locked up forever. So that's what they do. They return him to Broadmoor and he's still in Broadmoor to this day. After Brian was sent down for life, the NHS launched an inquiry to look at what had happened that a man had been released who then went on to kill again. And they did conclude that there had been systemic failures in Brian's mental health care. But they also noted that it's not as clear cut as saying, well, this was a huge error. This was a mistake and we can evidence why. Because they looked at the psychiatrists who'd worked with him and those psychiatrists who were very experienced, great at what they did, they said that they'd been fooled by him that he'd been calm, he'd been rational, he'd been amenable. He was an individual that on the exterior really seemed to be a model patient, somebody who'd worked hard, got on with his sentence, never caused them a moment's problem. They all felt that they had no idea whatsoever that they were staring a serious mental illness in the face. They said that one of the things that Brian was very adept at was that he manipulated his care regime. So he was able to make the system work for him. And what the report concluded was that there was no particular failure by any individual professional. So it wasn't that they decided that that individual made a decision that ultimately meant he was released and it was the wrong decision. It was just more that there was this culmination of issues that were missed because he was so good at hiding how unwell he was. Now, they also say that it was impossible potentially to have prevented Brian Cherry and Richard Loudwell being killed because even though he had this potential, he hid it so effectively that the professionals who were working with him genuinely didn't believe that he posed that much of a risk because they described Peter Bryan's condition as an atypical mental illness, which I'll talk about in a minute. But I'm always a little bit like, I'm not sure that that's correct. <laughs> I'm not a psychiatrist. I appreciate that. I'm just merely commenting on this. But the idea that Brian Cherries and Richard Loudwell's killings couldn't have been prevented because this guy was so good at pretending that he was perfectly all right because he had this atypical mental illness. May I draw your attention to him trying to throw a man out of a six-story building unprovoked and then him murdering an innocent 20-year-old girl after also hitting her brother around the head unprovoked. I'm imagining there was a fair amount of possibility that we could have looked at that and gone, probably shouldn't ever leave a secure unit. Let him be a model patient forever behind closed doors. And the fact that they say that they definitely couldn't have prevented Richard Loudwell's killing, you're like, well, I'm just going to throw it out there, guys. He just murdered Brian Cherry and mutilated his body and ate his brain. Are you really, are you all really trying to say that this guy is somebody that was fine to be unsupervised? Anyway, the report said this. He did not display the expected signs of schizophrenia and appeared to behave normally, even when seriously mentally unwell. Other than a couple of minor incidents during his early years at Rampton, Peter Bryan had not displayed any signs of aggressive behavior since he killed Nisha Chef. Well, I mean, it's pretty aggressive killing Nisha Chef, isn't it? And then he went on and killed poor Brian Cherry, and then he killed a prisoner patient, Loudwell. I don't know about you, but I think probably the bodies that have mounted up evidence that he just is not a safe person to be around full stop. And just because he doesn't exhibit serious mental illness doesn't mean he isn't a massive murderer. And again, I bring you back to my belief system about his serious antisocial personality disorder. That for me is what shines through. 
Now, in a second report, there was actually criticism of Broadmoor. So first of all, when he arrived there, there was very little apparently known about Brian. So that meant that he should have been kept under closer observation. Personally, I just think, I don't know, maybe a phone call, maybe a group meeting. We've got a bit of a dangerous guy coming, guys. What, more dangerous than the ones that we've got here? Well, apparently the, the sentencing report and the social worker has said that even more dangerous than all the people that we've got in here. What should we do then? I don't know. We'll leave him unsupervised in a dining room. It's a brilliant idea. That's why you're a psychiatrist in charge of being here. I'm not saying that's how it happened. Sorry. Can't help my sarcasm sometimes, but come on. Why wasn't there a lot known about Brian? There's a massive history there. They should have been aware. So the argument is he should have been under closer observation. And if he had been, Richard Loudwell would probably still be alive. Now that, without a doubt, is something that needed to be taken into consideration. And I'm sure that they changed protocol around how they dealt with new prisoners. I think that any infant listening to this, although it would be highly inappropriate age-wise, would be able to say that there were systematic failures in Brian's mental health care. And personally, I think that there should have been far more notice taken of the warning signs earlier on. I mean, let's think about it just for a minute. He displayed highly antisocial behaviour from an early age. Definitely that antisocial behaviour was around power and control. And he had a definite control killing mentality. You know, it was something that he wanted and fantasized about from a very early age. He went out of his way to bully kids that were weaker than him. He would take their possessions. He'd make them do things. He basically tried to treat them like a servant. He wanted them to tie shoes. He wanted to demean them. He relished feelings of dominance. Also, massive red flag regarding the treatment of females. This again, from a really young age, sexually inappropriate. And that demonstrates deeply concerning worries about his personality. And also, it feels like most of the behavior that he exhibited through the years was linked to this power obsession. So when it came to girls, he wanted to get sex from them. He sexually assaulted them, he fondled them, he physically assaulted the teacher, remember, late he assaulted Nisha's mother, his own employer. Shows massively narcissistic tendencies, doesn't it? He went out of his way to control and manipulate people. He was even able to manipulate to a really high level experienced health professionals. He went out of his way to use people how he wanted, to procure what he wanted from them. Remember what serial killers do, they look for desirable, available and vulnerable and they exploit them. They exploit them. That's what he did with his mugging victims, it's what he did with his employers, it's what he did with the state when he was claiming benefits that he wasn't entitled to. And all of that behaviour graduated him to killing. You see, that's what really stands out for me. It really does. It's the ultimate possession, isn't it? To consume another human being, to kill them, to take their body, to ingest it. Now they are a part of you. It's incredible power play. Grotesque, but nonetheless demonstrative of dominance to the highest degree. He would even go on to tell a psychologist that he went out of his way constantly to con and manipulate people. And he would do that by telling them what he wanted to hear. And that's exactly what con artists do. They make you believe that they like you. They make you believe they're interested in what you're interested in. They make you believe you're a good person. And then bit by bit, they begin to exploit your vulnerabilities. It's what makes them good at getting what they want. Without a doubt. What I've just described is evident to describe a serious antisocial personality disorder. You know, he's a psychopath without a doubt. Add to that mental illness, in this case, paranoid schizophrenia, and we have the perfect storm. Now, to use his moniker, the most ridiculous one that I've ever heard, Peckish Pete, is going to spend the rest of his life in a high 
level security mental facility. But this case for me, even though I know he's off the streets, it does give you that terrifying insight into how, when mental illness, psychopathy, narcissism, and criminal behavior collide. I mean, these individuals are rare, aren't they? But when they're born, when they're bred, when they grow, and when they become the potential that they have the possibility of becoming, it's terrifying. Because it does make you wonder, doesn't it? How many other ticking time bombs are out there? These ruthless, criminally insane killers who appear completely calm and rational one minute. And then the next minute, they could be dismembering you and eating your brains. Just as it happened to Brian Cherry. I would love to know your thoughts on this case. I would love to know whether it's one that you're aware of or whether you, like I, are shocked by the gravity of this man's crimes and the fact that he was allowed to commit more because he was able to hide his serious mental illness. Or you may have the cynicism like I have. Is this about his schizophrenia? Or is this just that he's a serial killer? conveniently using his mental illness to disguise the truth behind his malevolence. Because he has managed to serve his time at Broadmoor. And even though to many of us that would be a fate worse than death, I guarantee it's probably far superior to some of the prisons that the general population of prisoner has to endure. Let me know your thoughts. Give me a like. Subscribe if you've enjoyed this content and want to know more. I release my content on Wednesday and a Sunday. If you fancy some merch, I got the link. Go and buy it. Only if you want to, obviously. Remember, guys, be safe. Join me again next time for another cool crime with me, Emma Kenny. See you then.